And for each fund, I always get two options. One is growth and one is IDCW interim. What does that mean? Oh man, that used to be called the dividend option. Exactly, yeah. Uh, this IDC, so income distribution. Something, right. Oh is it the God. same as the dividend? It is the same as the dividend. People thought that this mutual fund dividends are the same as stock dividends. The most common uh, misconception is that suppose I hold two stocks in my portfolio and these two stocks are giving dividends. They assume that the dividend plan will take those dividends and give it to us. That's not how it works. Uh, so the dividends that are given in a stock, whether it is a growth plan or a dividend plan, they are always reinvested into the portfolio. In a dividend plan, if you choose the dividend plan, the fund manager will periodically sell some stocks, convert it into cash and declare a dividend from that cash. And once the dividend is declared, to the extent it of the dividend declared, the NAV will drop down. So if you look at the NAV of the IDCW, God, it's an awful, awful acronym. Uh, the NAV of that option will always be lower than that of the growth option because the, the gap, the difference has been paid out to the unit holders as dividends. And would you select one of the other? I mean, I've always just blindly selected the growth option. Uh... Growth always. The, the dividend option, uh, the dividends are taxed now as per slab. Earlier, the dividends used to be tax-free for equity funds. Uh, but now they are ta taxed as per slab. So it makes no sense to buy any kind of dividend plan for any kind of fund. Welcome back to Let's Get Rich with Pattu. We ended last week's episode on a tantalizing note when Pattu said, when we start looking at our investing decisions and we start targeting equity mutual funds, it's time to start forgetting about actively managed equity funds. Pattu, what a loaded statement. Um, I know it's going to create a lot of uh, reactions and lots of comments, etc., etc. Uh, let's start off our discussion from that point on. Um, I know your main reason was less than 50% or perhaps 50% are outperforming, um, you know, the benchmark uh, Nifty or the benchmark index funds. But now within those 50% that are performing well, is it worth investing in them? How does one select them? And what is that gain you're getting? See, the there are a couple of issues here. One is, so let's, if within the active uh, space, actively managed equity fund space, there are funds like large caps, large mid cap, mid cap, small caps, um, they have been around for several years. Yes. Right. So many of them have a lot of history. But there are funds like uh, multi caps and there are contra value focus. There are they are reasonably new categories mm -hmm. and there's not much of history to, you know, to test. But if you look at the established funds, fund categories, and if you see this 50% uh, underperforming the benchmark there's not much of confidence in holding the newer funds i mean you're, you're just uh doing experiments with your money sure I, I why why do that it's i mean i think we should respect our money a lot more than not to experiment with it so i, I so the point is you cannot pick future winners today if you insist that I will invest in an actively managed portfolio, then you must be ready to go through several years of underperformance. Are you really prepared to do that? I have done that. And uh, I, I hold a predominantly actively managed equity portfolio, uh, equity mutual fund portfolio, but that's an old portfolio. I mean, I can't suddenly switch to index funds. It will just be another fund in my portfolio because my existing portfolio is quite large. Mm. Adding a new index fund is not going to make any big dent in my portfolio strategy. It's going to, you know, create only clutter. But what about moving everything then to index funds? Uh, why pay tax? Amazing. That's a significant amount of, if I pay that much tax, I will get a notice, notice from the IT department straight away. <laughs> I mean, you uh, yeah. just because I like passive or the data says it's passive, you, you, I mean, you have to look at your own circumstances, right? Yeah. But at least for young earners, new mutual fund investors who have just started out investing, 
it makes absolutely no sense for them to make the kind of mistakes that I have done. Right. Because I, I know for sure most of them will get jittery. But it, clearly your old actively f- managed funds have done well and held you in good stead, Pattu. That's so, luck. Just luck. Huh? If you, I can show you my portfolio, maybe I track my, there have been significant periods where the, um, my portfolio, overall portfolio has just fallen right on top of a nifty index. Mm. So the outperformance I get is occasional and if anything, it's luck. Mm. There are two pieces of luck. One is my luck in selecting that fund and the luck of the fund manager in outperforming the index. And you can't distinguish between luck and skill in fund management, whether it is individual portfolio or a, because we have now, we have, there are studies which show that a monkey is throwing darts on a notice board and you create a portfolio of that is just as successful as humans. I'm almost a little nervous now about asking you this next question about fund managers, right? And the entire universe of how fund managers work. They are, some of them are considered superstars. Some of, you know, people try and invest based on their names. Uh, Some have genuinely done well. I mean, I don't know if you should go into this category of naming them, but what is your opinion about this entire community of fund managers? Because it's really highly paid individuals. There are some extraordinarily intelligent and mature level-headed people in the mutual fund industry at all levels, Hmm. fund management, selling, everything at all levels. However, you invest looking at a name. What if that guy gets hit by a bus? What if that guy or and more it really probable? Happened, but too, I mean, you know. Par- Parak Parak Mutual Fund. Exactly. I didn't want to name it, but it's so sad. But it's yeah. such a well-performing fund. Hats off to them, right? No, I mean, that, that happened to the promoter. Exactly. Uh, and uh, the, there was a risk of the fund manager being jailed because of that. And of course, he was he was let off. There was nothing there. But that's a huge risk, right? It's, it's, a, it's a risk for the unit holder, whatever it is. The news yeah. is a risk for the unit holder. But what is more probable is that anybody who is a star, who is so good that he can manage so much, why would he still be in the same company? He will just give in the notice and start his own PMS or start his own mutual fund company. How often have we seen that happen? Hmm. And what will you do? Follow him? I mean, it is not practical. Amazing. I've never thought of it that way. The, that is the risk with the fund manager. The, the problem, I mean, it's not about, see, and these are human beings. They can get it wrong. Eventually, somebody is going to get it wrong. You, the, nobody, whether it's Virat Kohli or you know, Sachin Tendulkar, whoever, they're not going to perform all the time. It's just not possible. Just when you think, oh, he's done well, first ball duck. Hmm. That's how it will be. I mean, so this is the risk that you want to Remove avoid. Remove from your life. Yeah. Exactly. And this is the risk you can control. Yeah. So you want to, um, I, mean, I mean, it's the point is, you cannot, when you cannot consistently beat the market and you don't know when you're going to beat the market, and why try? Hmm. The, the, the problem, with, I think we have talked about this before. Young people have this notion that they can replace their low income and build wealth with returns. That's not going to happen. It may happen occasionally. It's not going to happen on a sustained manner. The, so it's better to keep things as simple as possible and spend our time, our health on something more productive. So I would say no to all actively managed mutual funds, at least for young earners. So, so uh, in the previous episode, we talked about three categories in the equity universe. Yes. The actively managed fund space, which we have now rejected. Then there are factor indices and index funds. Yes. If you look at the factor indices, momentum, low volatility, alpha, etc, etc, etc. Now, I used to be very gung-ho about it. But there is a finance professional who for many obvious reasons did not want to be named. And he cautioned me by writing an article in Free Cal saying that there's a lot of data mining that is involved in creating these factor indices. And uh, 
so that means that they kind of cherry pick the formula they cherry pick the number of stocks that has to be put in the basket so that if you look at the back test oh it looks fantastic but if you put it in into create a product and put it out there in the real world we don't know how it's going to perform hmm. and the prime an extraordinary example i've just written about it is the case of the quality factor in the mid cap universe there is a f- uh, index called nifty mid cap 150 quality 50 so 50 stocks based on the quality definition i forget the definition we we'll look it up the quality definition 50 stocks chosen from the mid cap 150 universe so these are your quality stocks in your portfolio that's when you when you say it like that it sounds like that but if i take the returns or compare the evolution of for the last 12 years for the first 10 years in the journey the quality index has outperformed the base index that is the nifty mid cap 150 right so nifty mid cap 150 is your base index from that you are picking 50 stocks and creating a quality index so the quality index has outperformed for the first 10 years over okay. the last 12 years but all those gains has been erased in the next 2 years and we have only 12 year data no no we have data since 2000 only from april 2005 right uh, but uh, if you look at the last 12 year data 10 year outperformance is brilliant hmm. but all of it gone within the next 2 years but that so, could probably just be explained as sequence of returns risk right in a sense precisely so we should understand hmm. that the factor index product for which we are paying more than yeah. a normal index can outperform there are higher risks and those risks are not seen in a back test the back test will always be rosy and this finance expert i'm i'm going to call him anti factor expert just to he gave me some he uh, you know taught me something even more interesting he said there is a phase difference between what is hot in the west and what is hot in india a what difference sorry phase phase difference meaning time difference right so um factor indices were the next best thing in the west maybe 5 years ago 7 mm. years ago then people have understood that these it's not as rosy as it seems uh after a few years once the west has understood that some an idea is not as rosy as it seems that is when people in india are pushing that idea that's the time lag hmm. the, or a phase difference time that's the time lag i should say you understand so the, by the time we appreciate that there are risks involved etc etc the west would have moved on to something else yeah how do we re- reduce this phase i think every time we see a new new idea we should go back and see what people are doing in the west hmm. to some extent we can be saved hmm. you can uh, google fact failure of factor in uh, investing and there will be a lot of articles on that so again so the so that I mean, knocks not, out factor funds uh, rationally knocks out factor of hmm. course people will say i believe in it i i like personally low volatility investing because hmm. i know for sure i get a low volatile portfolio i am guaranteed of that so i like it but it may not outperform the market at all times but i i like it but again people like an idea only because it outperforms the moment it starts underperforming they move on to the next one absolutely that's not how you should hold up a, uh, a portfolio but this is how people behave so i would suggest stay away from active managed funds stay away from factor funds stick to the normal index funds and even within the normal index funds a nifty or a sensex index fund is all that you need that is all just buy those any one of those two uh, nifty or sensex and you have a 5 or 10 products to choose from so from 800 products in the equity space alone you have, you now have 10 products which is not not bad for a filter and within the index funds any particular one without naming of course brands but i'm saying nifty 50 nifty you know no the pro- the problem again here again the problem is risk the the mm-hmm. same as the fund manager today a fund will look like oh look i have got the cheapest fund 
that is why is a product cheap because the amc wants market uh, you know what do you call it share sorry they yeah. want market share absolutely once the aum user increases, acquisition once they have acquired enough assets they will jack it up mm. they will jack but they will say oh no no it is still less than other guys mm. so there is this uh, asterix comic called Asterix and the Mansion of the Gods. I'm not sure if people read comics anymore these days, but slightly older people will read it. And uh, so this is a Gaulish village, a French village on the coast, on the French coast. Caesar has given up trying to occupy this village. He has occupied okay. all of France except this village. So he says, let us Romanize them. Let us uh, take a land in the forest, cut off all the trees, build a mansion like a set of flats and ask the romans to go and stay there so these romans they uh, first day they go to the village and buy fish hmm. so the uh, then they realize oh my god the they uh, they say it loud that the fish prices are so cheap the next day the fishmonger has increased the prices yeah and that is what how the mutual fund industry behaves that is how the health industry, insurance industry, that's how all industries be. Mm. The moment you see something is cheap, it is you must see it as a trap or not a trap, at least a ploy to get Some you. Some caution, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I would say nothing's going to, um, I mean, no idea, no fund house, no fund manager stays on top. Everything is cyclic. On that note, though, I think it's a good time Patu, to ask in a very basic sense, for a newcomer to understand how do mutual funds make money they primarily make the money from the expense ratio so that if i the, put uh, 100 rupees and buy a few units and um, from that 100 rupees they take a certain amount and in fact invest only slightly say 99 for example right is that the expense ratio so there are two ways of doing this one is Every day before the NAV is declared, the fund deducts the total expense ratio. Mm -hmm. In a direct plan, the total exp expense ratio will only be the costs of running the fund. That is, they have to pay people like uh, the registrar and transfer agents like Carvi, uh, you know, CAMS. They have to pay them for maintaining records. They have to pay money to the trustees, etc. They, they of course, ser server costs, salaries, fund manager costs, etc. Mm. And so on. And is there, all this public knowledge, how much it is? Yes, yes, okay. yes. You can see it in the annual report. Everything will be uh, declared once a year in the annual report. So, uh, all that is part of the total expense ratio in a direct plan. In a regular plan, the total expense ratio will also include the commissions to be paid out to individuals. So that, that will have a higher expense ratio. So this total expense ratio will be removed from the net asset value before it is declared. So the NAV that you see is after expenses. Okay. But the first amount of money I put into it, it's not the entire amount that is invested in the units is what I'm trying to say, right? They take some money off it. No, they, they take it, they take it from the market value. So the NAV, they will right? invest the NAV, NAV has that cost. Uh, in ah, it. so they will invest that 100 rupees. But then that there will be a market value. From that market value, every day it's deducted before right. it's declared. So typically, what are the expense ratios for these passively managed index funds? They've, they've kept on increasing somewhere. I would say the range is 1% to 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.4, 0.5%, something of that order. Okay. And for a actively managed fund, how high does it go? For a direct plan, one one point five, one point eight percent approximately. I've, that's the kind of things I've seen. I've not paid too much attention to this, uh, but yeah, that's the kind. Of thing. It's not something to break our head about. I yeah. mean, uh, young earners or even experts or older investors should appreciate that this is a variable. If something, it's a variable not in our control. So why break our head too much about it? So right, and. Is it the right time to ask about taxation for mutual funds or is that so vast a topic that we should kind of shelve it for now? But basics, perhaps, if you can tease us with how does tax affect yeah, so, our investments? Um, again, it's, I think it's a ind independent uh, episode on, on its own, but the s simple basic, and this is at the time of making this content because every year this thing changes. Sure. You can't go back and... Uh, 
So, for uh, now, the rules say that if a fund holds up to 35% equity, mm -hmm. from 0% equity to 35% equity, when you redeem, the capital gains will be taxed as per slab. Fair enough. Simple. Right. If a fund holds equity 65% or more. You're talking about the equity funds. Yeah. Oh, no. The taxation equity is our guiding point for right. taxation. I'm talking about equity alone mm. now. So, from 0% equity to 35% equity, whenever you redeem, the capital gains will be taxed as per slab. And never before re redemption. Never before redemption for any fund. Then on the other end, so 0 to 35 is one end. Hmm. So on the other end, 65% to 100%, when you redeem, if the capital gains are less than 1 lakh or up to 1 lakh in a financial year, it is tax-free. Hmm. Okay. Above that, you have to pay tax at 10%. For the excess amount above one lakh, you have to pay a tax at x uh, four per, uh, uh, at ten percent and four percent on the tax for assess. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. So this is when uh, I'm talking about the long term capital gains. So which means that when I uh, the ten percent I said and the one lakh tax free amount is for a unit which is older than one year. I'm Got pulling it. out yeah. after uh, long terms. Let's not uh, complicate too much into short term. The, now you have a space between this 35 and 65. So any fund that holds equity less than 65%, but higher than 35%, if you redeem after three years, okay, the capital gain will be taxed at 25, so at 20%. At 20% with the cess, 4% cess. So let me say that again. Any fund that holds less than 65% equity, but greater than 35% equity, if you redeem those units after three years of holding, you have to pay tax at the rate of 20% with cess, but you can also use the cost inflation index and reduce your capital gain. We have to like property. Ex hmm. Yeah, like property. We can we have to explain this in, in a detailed manner. This is the basic rule. If the unit is less than three years, then you have to pay as per tax, as per slab. Got it. Okay. I was going to ask why this three year? That is the broad thing. I have not covered all the rules. There are some nuances. I think we should do it in a separate. Fine. fine. Anyway, uh, now I have another question for you, Patu, right? We've spoken a lot about how the basic decision on selecting a mutual fund is usually made on how it's done so far. And we've spoken so many times about how that's not dependable. You just cannot predict the future, right? So that's my question now on NFOs. You have so many NFOs coming up regularly. Have you ever invested in an NFO and what advice would you give for new fund offerings? See, NFO is not a problem. Again, the problem is us. Now, mutual, mutual funds say, there are two parts to the disclaimer. One, they say, subject to market risks. And they also say, past performance is not indicative of future performance. Yeah. If you go by that logic, I have a, two funds. I have A and B. A is a fund which is 25 years old. B is an NFO. Both of them have the same style, etc., etc., same category. And which should I choose? Now, the point is, people are, people will say, if you ask this question, people will say, always buy A, always buy the established performer. Mm -hmm. but the argument is past performance. Yeah. Disclaimer is there. It's literally 50-50. From any given point of time, you don't know what is going to happen in future. The, the, that's a wrong answer to a question to ask, I would say. You should not ask A or B. You should ask, is there any space in my portfolio for A or B? Does including this new fund or an old fund, whatever fund, make sense to me? See, I have I had in, uh, invested in the Parak Parik uh, Flexi Cap Fund when it was an NFO. Because oh. at that time, um, I have been investing since it was uh, since the time. At that time, I did not have 
a mid cap ish kind of value oriented fund in my portfolio understood so i happily took it which year was this roughly 10 13 or 14 i would say okay may 13 if i'm not wrong 2013 if i'm not oh yeah i think so yes and i also invested in the uti low volatility index fund because i'm a fan of low volatility in spite of our anti factor index guy cautioning me um i i like low volatility a lot and i just said uh, well let's see what happens hmm. i mean you, you the point is that people buy nfos for wrong reasons they look at the flyer and they are being told that this has got such a new idea that it will you know get you something new or there are still people who buy nfos because the nav is low yeah the nav is at 10 rupees or 1000 rupees doesn't matter because it, it is the change in the yeah. nav that's going to cost give you the return whether it is 1000 or 10000 doesn't matter what the nav is so if you buy it for the wrong reasons then an nfo is bad but if you if you can justify to yourself that i need this product because there's a space for me in my portfolio i mean not for you not you in the, your portfolio should have space you will have space to buy all the clutter in the world that is not what i'm saying there should be a rational you know uh, decision that, that has to be made about an nfo otherwise it's fine two questions to continue this nfo discussion one is was there something more than a gap in your portfolio requirement that made you go towards parak parik uh firstly and secondly i remember very vividly you telling me AUM matters, right? You always select a fund which has considerable amount of AUM. NFOs, there is no AUM under discussion. So, does that make any difference to a decision? AUM, see, in my okay, let me tell you my case. Uh, the reason why I chose Parak Parik is uh, someone I respect a lot in personal finance space. Again, some all these smart people don't want to be named. I Fair cannot enough. name him. Uh, you can create a name for him like you did <laughs> <laughs> no i can't even i it's hard to uh, so uh he had talked highly about what this fund can do and i respected his this, uh, his opinion and i just blindly accepted it i said fine i need i need such a fund this fund looks good let's buy it and see what happens by that time i had i had already gone through 5 years of no returns mm. right i had gone through that experience so what how how much hurt could it do to me that's the kind of uh, question i started asking it was a it was a bravado thing that's why i said it's luck yeah nobody could have predicted that parak parik will do well and there are many people who claim that parak parik has done well because of its foreign holdings there's that argument that is fine uh, but the way i see it i am not a big fan of holding a separate international equity fund because i have to worry about it i have to pay tax on it that in with, if i hold parak parik they hold 10% 20 20% whatever allowed and i get that much exposure because parak parik is almost 57% weight in my uh, equity portfolio so i get some marginal uh, you know exposure so that's how i looked at it. but you you asked a question i forgot um, about the aum part patu yeah the aum i don't think uh, for actively managed fund small aums are a problem actively managed fund small aums are not a problem interesting no, not a, not really a big problem in fact for in the case of small cap or momentum based funds small aums are welcome because they are happy to you know uh, and you know that's why i tell people who invest in small cap funds just keep an eye out whenever the uh, amc says i'm going to shut down for fresh investments that's probably some time for you to remove some money out of the small cap because that means the market has heated up and, and mm. so you have to keep an eye on this so it's for small cap yes small aums are small aims are actively managed is not a big problem from what i have seen for the passive funds small aums can be a big problem small i'm small aum means having 5 crore 10 crore in the fund 500 crore is fine mm. compared to so what is small is a very Exactly. Uh, subjective thing F- compared to a 5000 crore fund 500 crore is still fine you can still manage but 5 crore or 10 crore you are in trouble because a big 50 lakh trade can result in huge uh, tracking errors i have noticed that in passive funds they have actually out outperf- they ended up outperforming the index because of the small aum so it, i mean it's okay to grow with a fund as long as it's an actively managed fund i would say it's okay 
even if it is a nifty or a sensex fund small aums are fine as long as it is large cap centric mm. small aums are okay if i buy a small cap index fund with a small aum that can be trouble because if the market tanks tomorrow and there's a lot of selling in the small cap universe that fund is going to uh, find difficulty tracking the index that's so, comment you made on international investing part 2 is sticking with me um we, do you recommend investing in say for example a motilal oswal uh, whatever it's called right in, that invests in the us stock markets um what is your opinion on the investing in the us stock markets and how does one diversify out of india through mutual funds i have a question see the, if you look at the nasdaq 100 that fund was underwater for 13 years or i think 16 years after 1999 or 2000 mm -hmm. after the dot com crisis that fund never recovered to its previous peak it took almost 16 years for it to recover if after you start investing and the fund is always negative will you and you means the general audience will you still say oh i am holding this international equity for diversification in diversification matters that's when the volatility in my portfolio will be low will you keep saying that or will you quietly stop investing exit most people who say i want international diversification only want us diversification mm. they cannot handle what is happening in the european markets or the hang sang and so on they only and it's not just they they only want the five tech companies what, what do they call huh. the fang yeah and how do you know uh, whether this fang is always going to keep making money already they have uh, there's gone through you know a downturn after the covid because they they assume uh, this happens all the time once they see some growth because of some event and that event was the lockdown and people using uh, products at home yeah. the zoom and zoom calls etc etc at home they assume that will be the growth rate forever and they started hiring a lot of people and what happens then you lay off people mm. and we have seen that happen in all uh, fan companies now so so everything is cyclic so we must understand that uh, this international equity is they, they will go through a bad patch and will you be loyal to your diversification ideals during those bad patch i will bet my net worth nobody will be mm. because the only reason they have investing in this because they see something shiny it's the shiny object syndrome they see the nasdaq they see it's shiny therefore they want a piece of that they want to that's how that i mean it makes no sense to me because you have to maintain your portfolio so people will say i have they'll proudly announce i have 15 percent exposure to nasdaq 100 i have 10 percent exposure to gold that is the exposure today after one year that exposure will change what will you do then mm -hmm. will you reset it do you have the guts to buy and sell and pay the tax and reset it most people don't they will just leave it alone mm. so if they don't want to manage their portfolios they just want shiny objects and they will give these fancy terms like diversification i mean nobody knows i i have even asked this question everybody understands what diversification means but nobody or practically nobody knows how to evaluate diversification in a current portfolio or how to evaluate it every year and i think it's really not possible to evaluate it because most of the time it's clutter and even if you are going to evaluate it there's not much you're going to do about it right so i would say if you're interested so much in international equity buy a fund like parak parik that has got foreign equity at no additional tax for exactly you. and therefore you make the money of course it should be a big chunk in your portfolio to have that exposure so it's fine to stay within india's borders for now if for now yes yes yes, yes. amazing uh, i see we've hit a 32 minute mark but to uh, i just have questions pouring in from my own mind I, I imagine what the listeners and viewers are thinking right now uh, quick questions what's an open ended fund and what's a closed ended fund so an open ended fund is something where you can buy and sell units on every business day a closed ended fund is one after the nfo period is over it will not take in any more fresh subscriptions mm. you cannot buy uh, into the fund and if you want to sell the fund you will have to do it via a trading account and typically it is not possible unless 
you uh, for example we make a deal that i will sell uh, set this up in the demat account you buy it that kind of personal it's almost like an off market deal but it has to be done on market but so there's no liquidity in, in, for such things but so you basically can't sell practically speak so you can only sell when the fund is has closed its uh, i mean ended its maturity period and then it's kind of open to uh, sale and have you invested in any close ended funds do you recommend no. anyone they're do not it? necessary they're not necessary at all there are some interesting um closed ended funds in the sense that they will um they have a maturity date they have the something called target maturity funds in the debt space we can talk about that uh, when we do that but they may be useful in certain circumstances but i don't have hold any of the closed ended funds i have one quick question which um, you know i do a quick search on the platform i invest through right and i search for anything i search for uh, see i search for equity right now right and for each fund i always get two options one is growth and one is idc w interim what does that mean oh man that used to be called the dividend option exactly yeah um uh, this idc so income distribution something right Oh is it the God. same as the dividend it is the same as the dividend people thought that this mutual fund dividends are the same as stock dividends the most common uh, misconception is that suppose i hold two stocks in my portfolio and these two stocks are giving dividends they assume that the dividend plan will take those dividends and give it to us hmm. that's not how it works how does that, it work uh, so the dividends that are given in a stock whether it is a growth plan or a dividend plan they are always reinvested into the portfolio got it in a dividend plan if you choose the dividend plan the fund manager will periodically sell some stocks convert it into cash and declare a dividend from that cash and once the dividend is declared to the extent it of the dividend declared the nav will drop down So if you look at the NAV of the IDCW god it's an awful awful acronym uh the NAV of that option will always be lower than that of the growth option because the the gap the difference has been paid out to the unit holders as dividends and would you select one of the other i mean i've always just blindly selected the growth option uh growth always the the dividend option uh, the dividends are tax now as per slab earlier the dividends used to be tax free for equity funds uh but now they are ta- tax as per slab so it makes no sense to buy any kind of dividend plan for any kind of fund why do they even exist i mean is there a market a, for them it's a relic it's there's a market uh, at least among retirees who uh blindly buy or are being sold this balance so called balanced advantage funds with the annual uh, monthly dividend options so assume there's this income source for them it's not really an income source it is somebody taking money from the market at uh, the current market value and giving it back to you which you can do yourself if you right. want what is swp and stp so the systematic withdrawal is the opposite of the sip so where you have a let's say 1 crore corpus and you withdraw ev- every month 10000 from it every mm-hmm. month every week even every day whatever frequency you set or allowed so that is an withdrawal though the stp is basically a marketing ploy i would say sap and swps are also marketing ploys but the stp in particular is a marketing ploy because let's say i have 1 crore to invest and i am saying i want to invest that in equity markets but i am scared hmm. so i want to uh, invest that if, uh, i want to uh, divide my 1 crore into 10 chunks or 20 chunks and invest every month and over a year maybe over one and a half years whatever time period and do that now the amc says if okay over one year one and a half years if you invest i know that you will not be loyal to me you can invest that money in any other fund right or you can put it in fds if you instead of that i will come up with a product say you take that 1 crore and put it in a liquid fund okay in my company in my product liquid so fund just they have the money with them ah now the aum is locked then you can set up a systematic transfer from the liquid fund into the equity fund so every month or every week some money will go into the then they say oh it will help you uh, 
uh, you know uh, average out volatility etc but what they are basically trying to do is lock in the business that's all got it and why did you have that comment for swp's systematic withdrawal plan uh, as it's not uh, it's not necessary right i mean it's and also see what what happens is that swps are a dangerous product suppose i set up an swp from an equity fund or a balanced advantage fund or an aggressive hybrid fund if the market is falling your nav will drop mm. your swp will have, will be a fixed amount so for the your nav will drop so Got for it. the same amount you will be drawing more and more units yeah you will erode your capital more if you set up an swp in a volatile equity fund so you should only set up swps from liquid funds or money market funds or arbitrage funds and so on nice so be careful but to this could continue forever right uh, urging all our listeners and viewers to please send in your questions your Uh, life situations your case studies your particular fund questions etc etc for but when me to answer mutual funds is going to be a evergreen topic i think there's so much to talk about we'll also dedicate an entire episode or two on to debt because i clearly don't know enough and i want to know enough because i really need to take rebalancing seriously etc etc for now but to as always uh, i'm i'm forced to stop this discussion because of time but thanks so much and i'll see you next week thank you bye bye